The audience, participants, and general public should be aware that any or all portions of this open meeting may be recorded by audio and video resources. All of some of this meeting may be rebroadcast periodically by WRPS or other outlets. Persons wanting a DVD copy of this meeting should contact WRPS or the Board of Selectmen's office. A small fee will be charged. All right. Let me see if I can bring this. Back up. All right, the first thing on the agenda is uh, we have a public meeting for uh, adopting a proposed bylaw change that was posted in the Patriot Ledger. Um, I don't know, the week of May 12th, 2020, and it involves the FEMA. Uh, Pat, do you have any input on this? Like, I was told by Jen, the assistant town administrator, that this was basically had to be done so we would be in compliance with the new changes to um, the laws so people can get flood insurance if they need it. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't really look at this, but I know other towns have, have needed to do it in order to um, adopt the it, this I don't, I'm not sure if it's to adopt the newly revised flood maps or if it's to um, adopt some bylaws that get you into compliance with the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, but either way, it, it is typically required in order for people in the town to um, secure flood insurance from FEMA. I believe it is actually both, Mr. Chairman, my understanding of these. Um, when I worked for former Senator Headland, uh, Marshfield constituents specifically had to do these several years ago because they were on the front line of the updated plane. So um, <clears throat> I think that's exactly what they're for, more or less so that folks can get flood insurance should they need it. State also provides a template of these type of bylaws to make sure that you know you don't miss anything. Mm -hmm. um, so we worked off that template as well, and uh, it's been signed off on by all the uh, state people that needed to look at it. So we comply with all the requirements. Perfect. Does anybody else have anything to add on about these proposed articles? Mr. Chairman, I talked with Tom Rubel this morning, who I guess is one of the ones that's going to administer this. He said basically the same thing, that there's no real changes other than it has to be done in order for the town to get grants that may come along and that type of thing, that there's no major changes um, from what's in place now. Right, do we have anybody on the phone or anything from the public that wants to say anything? Do we need a motion to open the public hearing first? I suppose we're done. We should, should we, are you uh, making that motion, Jared? Yeah, I'll make that motion, Jared Valenzuela, Chrissy, to open the public hearing. John will second it. All that in favor? Uh, got a roll call, sorry. Yeah, we got a roll call, all right, Charlie? Yes, in favor. Jared? In favor. John? In favor. All right, I'm Mike Corbett, I'm in, I'm in favor. All right, so we've heard what was, what was said by Tony and, and Pat and everything. And if it's just being in compliance, so if people need to have the flood insurance. Um, can I get a motion to adopt the language? for articles 45, 46, and 47. Hold on, hold on one second. So, um, do we have to read them? No, nope. um, but what you have to do, well, you don't have to read the full one, but I think you should just at least read the summary of what each article does um, as it appears after each article on the front of the, uh, the notice. So like the one sentence that appears after the bold, like article 45. All right, now I gotta, I gotta and, then, and then also, um, so again, you got a roll call vote, 
and then you have to you have to do it for each article. So you got to do it three times because we have 45, 46, and 47. Uh, I'm gonna find it on my phone. That's not. Mr. Corbett. Yes. Rob Rosa, 474 Beach Street. Um, just had a couple of questions about this. Uh, thing okay. is, I don't know if there's anybody here that's going to be able to address them. Uh, shoot out the question. Maybe somebody has an answer. You know what I mean? Um, I have not had a chance to see all the maps. Um, and I guess the fir my first question is, how many properties in the town are going to be affected by this? With well, the court, basically since 2000 and I think it was 2013, we did our first one. Uh, myself and Greg Tanzi have been doing letters of map amendment for several people in this town uh, because most of the flood zones within the town are A zones. Um, and the problem with an A zone is, is that there is, no, there is no elevation that you can actually calculate without going through major, major steps. And the reason why FEMA has A zones on their, on their, on their maps is because they will come right out and tell you that they don't have the information to be able to calculate uh, the, the actual flood height. Um, Mr. Brennan, you can, you can ring in on this and, and check me if I'm wrong, but that's basically, that's basically always been our understanding of the A zones. And in, again, since basically 2013, myself and again, through several of the companies that I work for, we've, were, we've been able to get people out of the flood zone based on these letters of map amendment. And I'm just wondering how many of these, how many of these residential and commercial properties are gonna get tossed back in. Does anybody look yeah, at that? Does anybody have an answer? So I just, I just looked at the maps real quick. I mean, it, there's not a lot of residential property that is going to be affected. But like you say, Rob, it's all zone A. Um, but it doesn't look like it's going to affect many properties. Okay. That, but that's kind of the problem. FEMA went through when they redid the FIS profile for, I read the profiles. They did some serious work on this. And to not actually calculate the information was kind of a waste of time. Um, I can't see this being like a one month, two month thing. This seems to have, the, in my mind, this seems to have been a, at least a year long process. And number one, nobody really in the town knew about this. Uh, number two, I'd like an actual count of how many, of how many properties are actually going to be affected by this. Um, I mean, this is a big deal. I'm not saying that I'm not in favor of this. I mean, anything, anything that will help our town come into compliance, that's, that's big. If it's going to help us be able to apply and get grant money, that's a big thing too. But I'm also looking at what and how it's going to affect everybody going down the, everybody going down the chain. So. Rob, I got a, a paper here that, I think was part of what Chrissy sent out. I'm not sure, but it's listing it by panels, mm -hmm. which uh, 25023C shows 89 parcels. 25023C shows 91. Mm -hmm. Well, these are all the same panels. The big question is how many of those are getting put into the flood zone? and in relation to the ones that have already been taken out. You know, do these maps take into consideration the, the, the letters of map amendment that have already been, that have already been established since 2013, not just by uh, any company that I work for, but any other surveyor, engineer, or architectural company that's done uh, letters of map amendment? I guess I don't, I mean, this is just speculating, Rob, I don't know. I mean, if you've went, to, if you've gone through the process of a LOMA, doesn't that usually? I don't understand how a, a new town zoning bylaw by could supersede because the FEMA, map, the FEMA maps are changing. Right. There's, yeah. They. I mean, they do how many? 
years now, every two or three years now? No, the last one was 2012 for, uh, for basically the South Shore. Last one was 2012. Hingham fought it. Uh, Quincy fought it. Uh, uh, Marshfield fought it. Uh, and they got, a, they got a lot of it changed and a lot of properties taken out. Um, but what I'm looking at is in this town, the majority of the flood zones are A zones. Uh, and with those A zones, there is nothing that you can calculate. You can only trace a line that comes from that map. Um, and then when you do a letter of map amendment, usually you get, a, and again, I'm going to say 97% of all the Lomas that I've ever done for properties that are in an A zone, FEMA will take the structure out of the, out of the flood zone. Um, and they will, they'll come right out and say that we don't have enough information to calculate it. I and mean, it's basically, it's a caveat on the back of the actual letter that says, currently we do not have enough information to calculate the current flood height. So we, were, we are gonna pull your structure out of, out of the flood zone. But in future years, if we gain that information and change that, uh, change that, uh, the, that flood zone, we may put you back in. I understand what you're saying. But so are they gonna put them back in one way or the other? Not necessarily, not if they actually calculated an elevation because the, the A zone is a digitized line. It's not an actual physical line that can be measured on the ground. An A E zone, an A zone with an E stands for elevation, I believe, mm -hmm. but the A E zone actually has an elevation attached to it. You can measure that on the ground. And typically uh, you can just go to the, to, the, to, to the town's topographical, to our town's topographical maps, and you can tell what's going on. Um, you can also, you know, if you get out to the property and you see that the substantial changes and stuff like that, you can see that too. But nine times out of 10, when we're looking at, you know, when I've looked at uh, properties for, you know, elevation certificates or letters of map amendment, you look at the topographical maps and it's, you can usually see that they're, that they're out, that they're, that, that these things are out. Um, and unfortunately they're being put in by FEMA and the banks that are requiring these because of reverse mortgages, uh, first time mortgages or refis are now telling people, oh, your house is in a flood zone. And well, it wasn't when I first bought it. Well, now it is, you know? And now a lot of these people that, again, if they refi, let's say they refied in 2013, we were able to get them out or somebody else was able to get them out of the flood zone. Let's say they go to, they go to refi again and it's back in. Now they have to go through that whole process again because it's an A zone and five years down the line, they're just going to change it again, you know, or something like that. These, it's just, that's, that's my, that's, that's my, that's my issue with this. And just to know that, to know that somebody actually looked at the residential properties that are affected by this. And there's a, there's a number of them, you know, if, 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 if somebody actually looked at it, that's really kind of what I'm, I'm, I'm questioning. I have, I have something here. I, I got something from FEMA, mm -hmm. know, the you know, selectman's office and everything. <clears throat> and I was copied on it. Um, the highway department, Tom Rugel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know I mean, and uh, there's on a quick count, there's 50, like 50 properties in Rockland that are listed on it. A total of 50 properties. Yes, on a quick count, give or take 50, plus or minus. All right. And the last couple that were added, there were two added last year. And the records that I have here, it started in 1999. And these yeah, are, I mean, so these it's are properties more, that were taken out? I don't see that. You there's know what I mean? Property, there's a lot more properties in the town that are that are in that are in the flood zone than than 50, um, but within this area where they're changing the flood zone, where they where they recalculate where they recalculate the FIS profile, um, I'd like to know how many are within that, because this has the this has the the potential of severely affecting people. Again, I I've tried to look at the maps before. Um, the map that was made available to me was, was one in Abington, had nothing to do with our town. Yeah. And then, uh, talked to Doug, Doug found the maps, 
uh, I just, I unfortunately, I work for a living. So I did not have time during the day to get in there to see these maps um, or to get a copy of them. So I, I think Jen would like to say something. I was gonna say, jump in, Jen. Thank you, John. Um, thank you, everybody. Sorry for hopping on late. I had a little trouble with the link. I want to back up, and I'm sorry. I see Tony's on the call, so Tony, please um, jump in <laughs> wherever you feel I need to be corrected. But the purpose, just I think I need to back the conversation up from what I'm hearing right now. Rockland is part of the National Flood Insurance Program, so that makes flood insurance at an affordable rate available to the residents of Rockland. FEMA did in fact update their maps. In order for Rockland to, to remain a participant in the program, we need to adopt a bylaw and adopt the new maps as well. Previously, Rockland had included in their uh, Board of Health Rules and Regulations a floodplain policy, which I'm not even sure, and this is no, this is probably not that uncommon for communities that did it this way originally. Um, the trouble with it is that it, it tends to not get enforced um, because communities forget that they're even in their Board of Health rules and regulations. So it's highly preferable to have the, the um, floodplain overlay bylaw in place. This has been, the draft was done um, by Bob Galvin's office. It's been vetted with DCR that has approved it and it is the better way to go. Either way, it has to be done in order for us to stay in the program. And I apologize, Rob, I didn't hear the beginning um, of your point. If there's an issue with some of the panels or you feel that it needs to be an amendment, I think that's something we could probably look into down the road. But the long and short of it is if we do not adopt um, the bylaw now and update the, the, the new maps, we will no longer be eligible to participate in the program. And that's and a good I, reason to do this. That's an absolutely good reason to do this. I'm just trying to figure out why this is really the first time that anybody's really hearing about this. How long has this process been going on? I cannot answer, I don't know. How long have you been working on it? Um, probably just the past couple of months when we were notified by DCR that the maps were being updated and we needed to update our bylaw, which mm -hmm. we then later found out we didn't have a bylaw and then we had to do some digging to find out that it was actually in our Board of Health, Board of Health Rules and Regulations, which I think is, goes exactly to the point that it wasn't being enforced because people weren't even aware that we had uh, floodplain rules and regulations. I knew about it. I knew about it in 2013. Okay. And uh, there's there's a lot of there's just there's a lot of things that just don't make sense. And I'm just I'm trying to understand why it, it just it feels like it's the whole thing is getting presented in a very expedited manner. And I just, I, it just feels, it, it, it feels a little hanky. I, I, it, it's like where it, where everybody, most specifically the planning board is being told that they have to do this, but yet nobody even really had a good opportunity to look at it or understand it. So, so Yep. To answer that question, Rob, part of the issue too was the delay from FEMA getting the maps out when you were notified that we received the maps was the first that we had seen them as well. To kind of compound the, the problem, FEMA in this current crisis, FEMA has refused to push back the dates by which communities need to adopt the updated maps, which doesn't help any of us because probably rightfully so, we're not all focused on FEMA's flood maps at the moment, um, but they will not budge on that. If we had a regularly scheduled town meeting in a, reg in a normal year, we would, we would, you would have had to go back and do what? Have a, another town meeting to adopt all these bylaws? I'm not sure I follow the question, Mike. Well, because, you know, this this is just happening so late. But if we had regular town meeting, that was would have been at the beginning beginning of the month. You know, I mean, FEMA got everything out so late to the, to the towns and stuff like that. Where we had a reschedule a special town meeting just to adopt these bylaws to be in compliance. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think we ultimately did get the maps in time, even if we had our regularly scheduled meeting. Currently, the other issue for a lot of communities or those communities 
that are concerned they're not going to be able to have a town meeting prior to the July 22nd um, effective date of the maps. We right now are not in that um, situation. So, you know, that's not what I saw. On the documentation that Doug, that Doug gave me, it said that it was basically there was a 90 day appeal period and nobody from the town said boo. Nobody said anything. Nobody said anything about it. So this has been going on a lot longer than than the last couple of months that you've been working on it. Um, if you look at the documentation that that Doug did give me, the dates go way before this. We're talking September of last year. So the FEMA maps were generated, and all of this was started, and the town was notified. But then the 90 day appeal period went by, nobody said a word, and now it's coming upon this, and now we're being forced to have to vote on this. I'm just trying to understand why nobody, why nobody really knew about it. I'm just trying to understand that because this is gonna affect the town. You know, and again, I appreciate the, I appreciate the, the, the bylaw. I appreciate the flood, the, the flood bylaw that has to get passed. And I guess another question is, do we have, can we approve the flood, the, the floodplain bylaw without approving the maps? Until someone, and it's, until someone else looks at it, whether we have Pat Brennan or whether we have, again, uh, we have people in the town that work with this on a daily basis, people that volunteer their time to be able to look at this. Um, so I think one way or another, Rob, and I, 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 you know, unfortunately, we can't go back to to whatever ninety day window there was to. No, we can't. It. It's done. They're gonna they're gonna they're gonna approve it, and it's done. So. That, horse, that horse, unfortunately, is out of the barn. So, you know, I get working in the legislature like I did for a coastal senator. Frankly, I don't think Rockland is as affected by this as say Hingham Hall, Cohasset, Norwell. Those, I'm sorry, situate Marshfield Town Center, literally on the coast of coastal properties. I understand folks are affected by it and it's something that needs to be addressed, especially the maps. I mean, if the maps are, are incorrect and could have been appealed, they, they should have been, but unfortunately we can't go back in time and, and, and appeal them. Um, so to that end, you know, what do we do? Do we let these pass by and force uh, residents in Rockland that are currently in the NFIP uh, out of it because we are no longer eligible as a community. You know, unfortunately, I think that's what we're faced with now. And um, no, that we, we, have to, we have to approve that. I have not. We that that should be approved because that's going to help people get a flood insurance at a less affordable rate. That's that that's does nothing but help the help the community. Just the sheer fact that if you're putting people into a flood zone that weren't in a flood zone before. You're forcing them to either A, get flood insurance, or B, have to pay the money to try and get back out, which if it's an A zone, they're just going to change it in five years and put them back in. So it's like... But now to your point, like I'll, I'll use my house as an example. I'm not in a flood zone. Suppose these maps put my house in a flood zone. Now I'm a little annoyed. Maybe the town could have appealed it. I don't know. But can't I then apply for a LOMA to dispute that anyway? You You can. You can, but the problem is, is that with an A zone, it's a 50-50 shot. It's right. a 50-50 shot. It's a 50 50 uh, shot. It's a gamble. Uh, than, than the odds with, with the federal government usually. So, Rob, typically, typically uh, with an A zone, it's easy to get out, typically. But. Rob, I know you've done it a few of them, and I have down in my office probably 15, maybe as many as 20 properties that have gone through the process and I think every one of them has been taken out. Mm -hmm. um, there's quite a few on Hingham Street. Sawmill Lane has a bunch of them. Yeah. Um, That's I don't far and away from what we're dealing with though, I think. Well, I don't think we had any choice. I think we've got to go ahead and approve this and then work with it later. And if there's something that can be done later and maybe Jen can take a look at that and see what happens, I don't know. But I think at this point we've got to pass this and move forward. I have something here too, Rob, to your, to your point that things should have been done a long time ago. Yeah, because the town was notified according to the stuff I have, August 28, 2018. And the 90 day appeal process started September 11th, 
2018, according to this letter. 2018, I thought it was 19. So it's even, so it's two and, years. And the letter I have back from FEMA is January 22nd, 2020. So during that whole time, there's probably a lot of stuff happening in the town, as we all know, that everything got pushed by the wayside. Yeah, actually, if you look at the time period, yeah, I guess, yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah, everything was, you can say the ball was dropped, but who was driving the ship? True, true. No, okay, no, I, now, now I get in, now I see some of the time period. I see how it's, I see how it all works out. And I know who was dealing with the original uh, floodplain bylaw or whatever it was that was supposed to, okay. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, things maybe should have been addressed a little bit differently, but a lot was going on and that was the top, this was not top, top priority. No, back at that time, you were, you were 100% right. You were 100% right. Yeah, and Rob, from at least late winter through now, we were working with DCR um, and Bob Galvin's office on the, on the overlay district and whether or not to have you know, even getting ahead of the game. So it wasn't complete, you know, there wasn't a necessarily a ball that was dropped that I'm aware of. Um, I think I'm not saying a ball was dropped. I'm saying it was hidden behind somebody's back for a long time and just kind of thrown on everybody now. So that's what, that's kind of what I, I'm, I'm a little annoyed about, but it is what it is. Sorry, Mike, I missed you then. When did you say the first notice came in on this? The time was notified August 28th, 2018. And the 90 day appeal process started September 11th. You're muted. You're muted, Jared. <laughs> there we go. All right. Uh, no, I, I don't think we need to, um, I don't think we need to belabor the point um, at this point, unfortunately, it is what it is. And yep. Yeah. If, if I might add, um, Mike, if it's okay with you. Yep, go ahead, Pat. Um, I think Rob's main concern is about the people that have already paid to for Lomas to get their properties out of the flood zone. You know, what happens to those people with the new flood maps? Um, it, it depends, but for the most part, FEMA will revalidate those Lomas and, and letter map changes with the new flood maps if FEMA has not done the detailed study that would show that they should actually be in the floodplain. Um, FEMA right now in Rockland, there's 31 LOMAs that have been approved, one LOM R, um, and there was a revalidation of a LOMA from a previous effective flood map. So um, there's 33 total right now that have been removed from the flood zone by one of those processes. And chances are, if FEMA did not do an actual detailed study with flood elevations, um, getting it to the AE zones, those LOMAs would, would, I'm gonna guess, there's a good chance that they'll be revalidated and people won't have to repay to take their properties out again. Thank you, Pat. Any other questions? All right, so Tony, if we proceed with this, we have to basically stop, read the article, or at least the beginning of every the three articles here? Yeah, just the one sentence after, and then what you're doing is um, you're voting uh, not to approve this bylaw, but to uh, recommend its passage to the town meeting. So um, in each article, you, you know, vote to vote to recommend to the town meeting that the town meeting adopts each of the three articles. All right, so uh, on article 45 here, will the town vote to amend article three establish establishment of a district 415-3 uh, of the Rockland general code zoning bylaws by adding a new district entitled the flood plain overlay district to the existing list of zoning districts as followed. That would be number P, uh, the floodplain overlay district, or take any other action relative there too. 
Um, basically, everybody had the select the board of selectmen proposing the change to the town's. Oh, no, you don't have to read that part. Okay. I'll make a motion to recommend approval. That's Jared Allen's Ola Christie. And I will second it, Charlie. Okay. So all those in favor? Jared? Yes. Charlie? Yes, in favor. John? Yes, in favor. Uh, Michael, yes, I recommend it to proceed to town meeting. Randy's here too, yes. Thank you, Randy. When did you jump in? I didn't see you. Uh, about five minutes after, uh, after I said I was almost home. <laughs> Thanks for joining. No. All right, uh, I'm, the, I'm the AAO 1030 without the picture. It says Randy on there. Okay. All right, uh, Article 46, with a town vote to amend Article 3, establishment of districts. 415-4, the zoning map of the Rockland General Code zoning bylaws by depicting the boundaries of the, what is I'm not trying to read on my phone here. Enumerated zoning district by adding the zoning district entitled floodplain overlay district to include all areas of the Plymouth County flood. Insurance rate map issued by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, dated July 22nd, 2020, and identified as a special floodplain hazard located within the jurisdiction of the town of Rockland and designated as Zone A and AE. The exact boundary of the district may be defined by the 100 year flood elevations shown on the firm and further defined by the flood insurance study report dated July 22nd, 2020 on file with the town clerk. Any other action relative there too? I'll make a motion to recommend approval. Jared Alanzola. John will second it. Um, we'll take a vote. Uh, Jared? Yes. John? Yes. Charlie? Yes. Randy? Yes. I'm Michael, yes. We recommend Article 46 to proceed to town meeting. All right, Article 47. Will the town vote to amend Article 1V per permitted use by inserting the proposed new zoning overlay districts as follows? All right, this is the floodplain overlay district, and it's a long one. We have. Yeah, you don't have to read that. Yep, we have the purpose A, B. So, you know, it goes on for pages. Make a motion to recommend approval, Jared Valenzuela. Okay. Second, Randy. All right, uh, we'll take the vote. Uh, Jared? Yes. Randy? Hello. I thought I seconded. Randy, yes. Yeah. Charlie? Yes, in favor. John? Yes. Uh, Michael, I vote in favor to recommend Article 47 to proceed to town meeting. All right. And that basically closes the public hearing. I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Jared Valendola. John, I'll second it. I will right, we'll take the vote. All those in favor, Jared? Yes. John? Yes. Jolly? Yes. Randy? Yes. Uh, Michael? Yes. To close the public hearing. All right. Now what do we have here? All right, now that the public hearing is closed, we have a uh, new business. And before us, we have uh, the design re 
the site plan and design review for uh, the new elementary school project that's coming before us. So who would like to take the lead to explain the school? Good evening, um, I'm Lorraine Finnegan. I'm the project manager with SMMA. Um, with me today on the line are Michael Dauhan, our landscape architect, Chris Racine, our civil engineer, and Mariana Hernandez, our project architect. Um, Sean Burke from PMA, the OPM, is also on the line. I'm going to let um, Mike and Chris run us through the presentation, and um, um, they have an agenda slide, so I'll let them leave it out for you. Uh, I'm going to try to share my screen now, just um, host par par disable participant screen sharing. Okay. Could the host enable participant screen sharing by chance? Uh, can you do that first, Lisa? Yep, it says that they are available. Oh, One participant can share at a time. So unless someone else is sharing, we should be okay. Let's try it again. Here we go. Try one more time. Okay, I'm changing yep. it now. Yep. Is it's it working? working? Okay, good. It sure seems to be working. Want to see that screen? Yeah, it's not in presentation mode yet, Mike, but yes. All right, we have it up here. Mike, are you frozen? Huh? Mike Dauhan. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but it's not in, it's in, not in presentation mode yet. Can you go to uh, presentation mode, please? Yeah, I'm in presentation mode. Okay, it's on now. There you go. All right. This might be a little choppy, guys. I apologize ahead of time. So anyway, thank you for, uh, for letting us um, share our design for the Rockland Elementary School. Is this switching okay? Can you see the agenda now? Yes. Okay. So we'll, we'll walk through this and, and as we get through, through these steps here, we'll stop it uh, after every step to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to, um, to ask questions. Uh, while you do this presentation and get this thing rolling, I don't know, just so everybody's aware, we probably will not be voting on this whole school pro building tonight, you know, since you still have to go to zoning and, and get some zoning changes, but then when you come back to us in June, we understand. we'll have their um, decision so we can incorporate all that. Sure. Okay. Continue. So I'll go through a quick overview and, and walk through all these elements, as I said, and then we'll stop in between each one for questions or comments. Uh, you probably saw in the package, the project uh, is a new combined district right elementary school for grades one through four. It's located at Brian Duffy Way, one Brian Duffy Way at the location of the existing Memorial School. There's three elementary schools in the town that, um, that serve kindergarten through four, Memorial, Jefferson, and Eston. The idea is to take all of the uh, grades one through four children, put them into this new 760 student building, and the Eston school will be used for kindergarten only. Again, the new building, 760 students, two stories, about 120,000 GSF, uh, and Mariana later on will walk us uh, through all the materiality of the building. The new school includes outdoor learning spaces, new athletic fields, new vehicular and pedestrian circulation, parking, and of course, stormwater management improvements that we'll walk you through all of that stuff. Quickly, uh, the existing conditions, we're all aware of what's going on here. Number one is of course the existing school, five, uh, you see the five over there, that's the existing football field where the new school will sit. Um, you can see where it sits in terms of Lower Reed Division, Taunton Avenue, existing entry circulation, the blue and Red lines uh, signify site access and egress getting into the site. And then once you're in the site, of course, the yellow line signifies car and bus circulation. As you know, everybody shares cars and buses, both share Duffy Way. They both share the same route. Buses come in first right now, then uh, car drop off is after the buses have left. The red um, indicates pedestrian circulation. Some students come in from uh, the little right of way from Lower Reed. They get walked in through there and other students walk along the sidewalk coming in from Taunton Avenue. 
The topo, this is sort of important uh, to, uh, for, for later on in the presentation. The, the existing building FFP is about 119. It's about four feet higher than the field is right now. And it's about seven or so feet higher than the existing baseball field uh, behind the building. Also, the solar orientation is important when you see the building, the new building layout. Uh, I want to show this context plan because it's important to uh, understand uh, a, a brief overview of why the building is where it is, okay? So in the simplest terms, there's an existing building, A, and then adjacent to it is the existing field. Uh, the new building gets built on the new field, on the old field, excuse me. The new field gets built where the old building is. It's just flipping, it, it's, it's really, it's oversimplifying, but it's that simple. We just flip the buildings and the fields. Any questions about existing conditions so far? No. Nope. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna move on to the proposed site design and I've broken it into two pieces, moving in circulation and then sort of use areas. So here's the rendering, the latest, most current rendering of the site, uh, you can, as you can see, the new building sits again where the uh, where the existing field is. The new synthetic turf field and part of the parking will sit in the approximate location where the uh, existing building is. When we're designing these sort of things as a sort of an overview, sort of view from thirty thousand feet, we're always trying to focus on developing an infrastructure around the building. Uh, you know, that compl really complements the building, frames the outdoor spaces, frames the building, and ties all the program together. So as you walk through this thing, you'll see that there's some recurring themes um, through here. So the building is labeled there. Uh, you can see all the uh, different use elements. If there's any questions on any of the use elements, please let me know. Um, the softball field and the boys' baseball field are existing to remain. As you know, the, the, the girls' softball field will get new lights. The new synthetic turf field will also be lit. Uh, in lieu of standard bleachers, uh, we're going to take advantage of that topographic change between the elevation of the existing baseball field and the elevation of the new building. And we're terracing seating rather than building uh, bleachers that, are, that would create a real big vertical element. You can sort of see the vehicle circulation, which I'll walk you through in a little more detail in just a moment. That slide didn't come up through right. This is, well, this should show pedestrian and bicycle, bicycle circulation. I apologize, this, there's some line work missing on here. Pedestrian and bicycle circulation uh, will come in through the new right of way along. Um, Mike, you can use the drawing tool. Of course, I can. Uh, how about this, can everybody see that? Can you see my no. cursor? Yes. Yes. Okay, excellent. So the, the right of way that's uh, pedestrians only right now is going to be turned into uh, two way for cars. I'll get to that a little bit more in a minute. This was supposed to show some pedestrian bicycle circulation. There's bike racks at the front entrance, there's bike racks over by the playground, and there's bike racks over by the rear entrance. All of the circuit, all the um, main entrance doors and all of the site amenities, the ball fields, the existing fields, the proposed fields, the playgrounds, everything's all connected by a pedestrian circulation network that's all ADA compliant. Bus circulation, so all buses will come in from Taunton Avenue and will take a left and bus drop off is behind the building. There are seven bus drop off spaces back here behind the building. Buses can exit either through the front of the building or out onto Reed Street. All the students that get dropped off by bus enter the building from this rear door right over here. And there's a playground area for those students to play in in the morning and congregate in the morning. Again, I don't know what happened here, but passenger vehicle circulation. Passenger vehicles uh, are only allowed to access the front of the building where I'm moving the cursor through right now. This furthest north roadway along the property line is a two-way road. All this parking through here is designated as parent drop-off in the morning and for visitor parking in the afternoon and then parent pickup in the afternoon. The secondary access through here is drop-off only and it's one-way circulation for cars coming in from Lower Reed and it's parallel drop-off through here. So it's sort of drop-off kid 
kids get ac access directly to the sidewalk and into the building. So all the students that get dropped off by car enter the building from the front entrance and they also have a small uh, playground uh, to the west of the building to play in before, before school begins. Uh, any question in terms of circulation so far? I should mention that uh, nothing but buses are allowed to go in the back of the building, save of course, except for uh, emergency vehicles. The, um, the circulation has been designed so that delivery trucks do not go to the back of the building either. Can I ask a quick question? Yep, go ahead, ask. Mike, apologize, um, um, the bus route goes around the back of the building. Do they all sit, park, unload, and wait, or do they take right off and go right out, and do they just go out Reed Street, or are they coming back across the front of the school? So they have two different functions, Mike, if you want me to answer that. Yeah. In, in the morning, they pull up empty and keep going. In the evening, they pull up stack and wait for the kids to come out. So for drop off, it is instant. For pickup, they stack and wait. And then with respect to um, ingress and, and exit from the site, Mike, I'll let you take that if you can get back to the slide. Yeah, I'm trying, here we go. I, I have a question. What is to stop the cars coming in from like uh, Taunton Ave, uh, Division, Division Street? And, and taking the left? Yeah, and going into that like two-way area where you have the visitor parking and everything. Over here. Cars are allowed to do that. Cars are allowed to make that move from Division Street and Taunton Avenue. They're allowed to make that maneuver into these okay. spaces. They and are allowed. Then they'll just proceed and exit out towards Lower Reed Street? They can proceed to exit. This is, since this is two-way, they can either pull in and then leave back out by Division or Taunton, or they can leave by Lower Reed. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Right now we have signage. We're, right now there's signage indicating for all vehicles, for no, no vehicles except buses to take that hard left behind the building. Um, and there's some ongoing discussions whether or not it'll just be signage and striping or something more. Hasn't been determined yet. And, and there'll also be signage um, at the one-way parent drop-off area so that people coming from Taunton or Division Street cannot make that left turn into that one-way access in front of the building. Right. And just to be clear, when we say signage, we're talking about do not enter signs. Correct. Right. So not just any signage, it's a do not enter sign. So it's back to me with the bus thing. So we're coming around the back and we're leaving out Reed Street. We, or are we coming out like in that yellow was the bus thing and it's showing it coming back, but they can also come in front of those parking spaces in front of the building. I'm sorry, could you repeat that please? Where the yellow is the bus route, correct? Everything in the yellow? The yellow is the bus route, that's correct. So you have it leaving Reed Street. When it's come around the back, they unload and they go out to Reed, lower Reed Street straight ahead. Correct. Or it looks like they can go right and back around the front of the building. That's correct. So they'll be doing that as people are dropping off in those spaces to the left, dropping off kids and pulling into those parking spaces to come in the building, correct? Well, I think the anticipation is that the buses will do the drop off ahead of the uh, parents the way it is currently done. But they have, they have three options here, Mike, correct? They can go out to Lower Reed. Yep. They can go straight on Colonel Duffy Way back out to Taunton, or they can make the turn into the drop-off area, but it's highly unlikely they'll make that turn if they don't need to. Correct, correct. Good. Why would we even want to allow them to go back up to that drop-off area? If the bus is empty, uh, I would think you'd want to get them out of there as fast as possible. It's certainly feasible to just send everybody out through Lower Reed if that's what if that's what the community desires. Absolutely. So sometimes there are buses that they'll have for a field event, um, or there'll be a bus that's coming later. They wanted to make sure that there was the ability to pull a bus in there if we if they wanted to do that operationally. That's fine. I'm just worried about the jam in the morning. Let's just say. Yep. Mm -hmm. and if the, buses the buses are all come intended the to be front with kids cutting through and you know they're not going to follow the walk times they're going to cut through and all that and if you get buses coming across the front of the building in the morning that are empty to leave 
you could run into some backup uh, well, danger. I mean, wh whatever it is, I think the the idea of getting the buses out of there quick is that lower Reed Street area. Shoot them right out and buy. Yep. Any other questions regarding circulation? Okay. Not at this time. Okay. Uh, I'll walk you through the um, outdoor elements really quickly and then we'll stop again for questions. The front entrance is a is, is designed to be a pedestrian only plaza sort of entry sequence from the from the uh, from the parking and drop off areas. Um, it, it's a raised tableau uh, in, in in the sense that all this gray area where you see here is all at the same elevation as the building entrance. The roadway rises up to the tableau, drops back down. It's a six inch raise through here, so it creates a real pedestrian oriented space through here. Um, and then there's some transition using, we use, we're using plant material, um, trees, uh, different elements like rocks to create sort of a, a, a transition from the really flat paved area into the building. The drop off walkways are here and here. Along this drop off walkway, there'll be an ornamental metal fence that sits along this planted buffer area to prevent children from cutting across through here. It funnels everybody over into this main entrance. We're using large boulders as a means to keep the cars through this area and the, the boulders also create uh, the pedestrian spaces through here. This is a axonometric view of that of that front entrance. We left the trees out so you could so you could understand the space a little bit better. There are two outdoor learning environments uh, that are created in the spaces between the academic wings. Both of them will be programmed the same way. Uh, they have large group areas where there'll be raised seat walls with plantings behind them, uh, areas for teachers to congregate larger groups of children. There'll be small group areas as well. And there will also be um, tables set out there with, uh, you can see over here by number nine, number eight and nine, there'll be tables set out into these spaces with boards along the wall for outdoor teaching opportunities through there. These spaces will be completely enclosed. We're still working on the design of that enclosure. It may incorporate some sort of planters. Uh, it may not, but it, it, regardless, it'll be, fen it'll be completely fenced in with two means of access and egress that are going to be gated um, with panic bars uh, and fenced tall enough that you can't reach around from the outside. Both of the spaces look exactly the same. And this is our, uh, rough rendering of when you're inside one of those courtyard areas looking towards the entrance to the building. The outdoor learning environments and the rest of the site are all, um, we're gonna have a lot of interpretive signage so that we can tie the, um, tie the education curriculum into the site. Uh, it, uh, a lot of the stuff will be tied to, our, to, the, to the lead um, improvements that we're doing to the site, pedestrian circulation, heat island effect, um, bioretention areas things like that. There'll be signage throughout the site that, uh, that explains what we're doing. Courtyard area is under development. This is that center part of the building. Um, again, be a series of precast seat walls throughout um, a, raised, um, a raised turf berm in the center and some port in place uh, outdoor seating through here that's opposite uh, the same sort of element on the inside of the building. Is kind of a view, uh, a development view of the interior courtyard space. There won't be any large trees or plantings in here for maintenance purposes. Everything will be low uh, shrubs, perennials, ground covers, um, ornamental grasses, things that are easily maintained. Lots of paved area for kids to move around. I, I noticed in your um, plans that in a lot of the courtyards and open space areas, like you had uh, it was poured concrete in those areas like where you'd be walking? That's correct. Uh, it said uh, something, something I can't remember at the top of my head, like color A or something like that. What color is that? 
Uh, we haven't chosen the colors yet. They're probably going to be lights and dark grays. I would say a light gray and a dark gray. You okay. know, yeah. Uh, there, there's nothing, nothing outrageous. Uh, it, it, we could end up with browns and tans to match the building, but generally, I try to just go with light gray and dark gray to add some, to add some visual interest to the ground plane. Because otherwise, it's a pretty big space, you know. Okay, I was just wondering, to Mike, I couldn't. I, was, I gave a quick look. I didn't see like it you know, anywhere that would indicate what the color was. And I know sometimes when you color match concrete, <laughs> it doesn't always look pretty. Yeah, that's that's articulated in the specs, which we, we provided the plans, but we didn't provide all the specs. So that's articulated in the um, in the uh, colored concrete specification. So. Uh, the playground area is being developed with the, the there's two playground areas the south playground the north playground the south playground is the larger one it'll have right now it has two large play structures um it'll be the ground plane treatment will be a combination of synthetic rubber um the fall zones and, and there'll also be an area uh closer to the building where there'll be a basketball court some four square benches and this is all bituminous concrete through here all these areas you see through here where the play structures are is all enclosed. It's all fenced in. Two means of access and egress, two gates. One, uh, so that there's always two ways in and out of all these outdoor spaces. Um, and again, all this area through here is all uh, resilient rubber surface. There's a few uh, equipment precedents of what the, the type of equipment that's going to be out there. These play spheres that you see these children playing on, these sort of net type systems and some more, more vertical structures. And the ground plane treatment uh, will consist of graphics, uh, four square, things like that, and other types of graphics to add some visual interest for the students. Hopping over to the synthetic turf field area now. So it's gonna be a, a typical synthetic turf field, 50% um, uh, rubber, 50% sand, uh, the tuft height will be uh, ideal for soccer, football, and possibly field hockey if, if that's desired, and also lacrosse. Uh, it will be lit. As you can see, this, this sort of precedent image up here is actually from, from Holbrook. It's going to be a very similar to this in terms of the light fixtures in the field. Um, they even have a Bulldog logo like you guys, so that's why I included that there. Um, Here's, the ter here's some images of the terraced seating that we're talking about putting on the, uh, on the east side. So there's a lawn area where people can set up a lawn chair or a, or a blanket to relax, or you can sit, these are 18 inch height. Each of these sections are 18 inch height. So this is also, these also act as seat walls. And this will again be in lieu of a typical traditional um, bleacher setting. Any questions so far about the site design? Hearing none, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Racine now. He's our civil engineer, and he's going to walk everybody through the stormwater management aspects of the project. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so, under existing conditions, there is a perennial stream. I'm going to start off with stormwater management, and then I'll I'll just kind of touch base on uh, go over the rest of the site utilities. Um, but for stormwater management, there is uh, an existing um, <clears throat> perennial stream that uh, starts north of Reed Street, uh, as Mike's indicating there. Uh, just prior to Reed Street, it enters a concrete uh, head wall and then proceeds into a 48 inch um, reinforced concrete pipe culvert uh, that is routed uh, under the road through some adjacent properties, residential properties, and then it essentially is routed north to south right through the center of the site. Um, and then it continues. It's piped all the way underneath the rail trail, which is just south of the southern property line. Uh, and right after the rail trail, uh, the, the stream re resurfaces uh, at, a con at a stone end wall. The existing site drainage um, 
there's catch basins, uh, catch basins that are conveyed um, via pipes to the existing 48 inch RCP culvert. There's also pipes from the adjacent high school and middle school campuses um, that also tie into the 48 inch RCP pipe. Um, <clears throat> There's also some water, some stormwater in the from the uh, existing baseball field on the western portion of the site. That is the kind of the only area of the site that discharge that just flows overland to the south corner of the site and does not get directly into the 48 inch RCP pipe. So under proposed conditions, <clears throat> um, we are proposing to replace a portion of the 48 inch RCP pipe. And that's due to uh, some areas of very shallow cover that occur under existing conditions, as well as due to some conflicts with uh, the location of the, of the loading dock uh, and the depressed grades associated with that, which is in the, on the west side of the building, right where Mike's showing right there. Um, <clears throat> So that's why we are proposing to replace a portion of the existing pipe with a new three foot high by five foot wide concrete box culvert. The culvert itself has um, more capacity actually than the existing 48 inch pipe. It's also lower profile. Um, so it, it, it gives us more flexibility to route utilities over it. It increases the cover over the pipe as well. Um, so the actual stormwater components within the site, um, in order to mitigate peak rates of runoff, um, we're proposing a number of surface bioretention areas, which are, which are uh, those reddish hatched areas. So those are surface systems that'll be essentially planted with, um, with, with, with some grasses and small shrubs. Um, they're sh very shallow. They're only one to two feet in depth total. Uh, they're essentially intended to, to water, uh, essentially uh, flows overland to them. They're not, we're not conveying pipe, pipe outfalls to them. It's, it's capturing surface runoff. Uh, it's intended to um, filter through the plant material and the, the soil to provide treatment, which is also required. Um, I'll just take one step back. So we're designing the system to meet both the Massachusetts Stormwater Handbook as well as the, um, the regulations in the uh, Rockland, uh, the Rockland Stormwater Bylaw as well as the um, Planning Board Rules and Regulations. So <clears throat> uh, those, those systems, two of the systems to the right, uh, we are able to provide enough um, depth to groundwater where, where we're proposing um, them as, as exfiltration systems, meaning this, the water will pass through the, the plant material and the soil and will infiltrate into the ground to provide recharge. Uh, the other system to the north, uh, we don't have quite enough uh, cover uh, over groundwater, so that'll be a line system. Uh, the remaining boxes that you see in blue, those are subsurface detention systems. And I've got a couple slides after this that just show some some graphics of what those look like. Essentially, they're actually Mike. If you want to go to that right now, um, so to the the left into the lower photos, those are the examples of some bioretention areas. As you can see, they're very shallow. Um, you know, aesthetically pleasing. Uh, we actually in one location we have a kind of a boardwalk crossing through it, um, which is a you know a nice way to incorporate kind of learning and, and kids into nature while also having, um, you know, while also serving a purpose. Mike's just showing that area uh, in the upper, upper right. Um, <clears throat> and then the picture in the upper right there is just a, an exciting photo of the chambers that'll be installed underground, essentially plastic chambers uh, wrapped in filter fabric uh, underlaid by crushed stone with crushed stone on top as well. It's essentially acting as a, um, it's essentially acting as a one big area for water to, uh, to be stored and then eventually discharged 
if you could just go back uh, back to that plan, Mike. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so as Mike alluded to at the in the existing conditions description, the, the existing building um, finished floor elevation is at around 119. Um, we have the proposed building finished floor of the upper level at 119 and the lower depressed level uh, where the loading dock is at 117.5. And we, we chose this elevation uh, to, to maximize our separation to groundwater. Uh, there is shallow groundwater, relative, uh, relatively shallow throughout the whole site, uh, as well as to be able to tie into the, the new three foot by five foot box culvert. Um, so all of these systems, the subsurface systems, as well as the surface bioretention areas, uh, after they uh, collect the water, they will be routed, any overflow gets routed through uh, uh, via pipes to the new box culvert, which, which also ties in uh, at the southeast corner of the new synthetic turf field into the existing 48 inch pipe. So by, by setting the elevation where we did, it, it, it allows us to efficiently tie into that new box culvert um, and also to get uh, the cover we need. Um, so we are also rerouting a portion, uh, a portion of existing pipe from the high school and middle school campus, as well as a portion of pipe that runs actually just north of the existing basketball court. It's not highlighted on this plan, but uh, there's a yeah, there's a pipe coming right from that upper corner that runs right through the proposed building. So we're rerouting that around and tying it into the new box culvert as well. Um, the, the synthetic turf field uh, will have, um, it has a series of perforated under drains, uh, panel drains essentially that capture stormwater. We have an outlet control structure and that water is routed, uh, conveyed to the uh, uh, one side is conveyed to the existing RC 48 inch pipe. Uh, the eastern side is conveyed to the manhole that ties in uh, the new culvert and the existing pipe. So we are maintaining um, existing drainage patterns. Um, the eastern side, oh, sorry, excuse me, the west side of the field, uh, that overland flow is still uh, going to be flowing in the in the southwest direction to the to the southwest corner of the site. Um, we are matching or mitigating peak rates of runoff for all of our storms, um, and providing uh, treatment as well as meeting the other stormwater criteria to the maximum extent feasible for a redevelopment project, which this project qualifies as. Um, if you want to just stay on this plan, Mike. Uh, so we're also from other site utilities, we're going to be we're providing uh, a new uh, new eight inch uh, ductile iron water loop that ties in uh, at Reed Street at the Reed Street um, the access drive connection at Reed Street that will that new eight, eight inch water line will route around the building as well as in front of the building and it will tie into We'll also have a connection point at the Taunton Ave Division Street intersection to provide redundancy um, in case you know there's an issue that they need to repair or shut shut a valve down uh, to service the pipe. Uh, we've got new hydrant locations around the building, um, which we've preliminarily coordinated with the fire department. We will continue to coordinate with them as the as the design is finalized. Um, <clears throat> we have. Uh, series of new sanitary connections coming out of the building um, as well as kitchen waste that is coming out at the in the loading dock the service area on the west side of the building um, these sanitary pipes will be uh, will be conveyed via gravity to the uh, there's an existing 15 inch sewer main that runs actually right through the baseball field west of the new synthetic turf field. So we are tying into that sewer main uh, as part of the project. Um, we'll also, we also have a new gas service coming off of Reed Street 
as well as um, new uh, underground electric telecommunications and fiber. Um, routed from overhead poles and then underground to the school itself. I think that's it. Does anybody have any questions regarding the stormwater or site utilities? I have a question. Um, I guess it's basically on Colonel Duffy way with it. Like now I, I've, I've seen in the past, like a lot of the people that live that border that, that backyard comes up on Colonel Duffy way. They, get a lot of water yep with all this work and all your new drainage and everything will the conditions improve for those people yes the conditions should improve for those people under existing conditions there's a small portion of lawn on the school property that actually pitches towards those properties and apparently also during large storm events because there's no real curb there along the edge of duffy way that uh, there, are, there are times when water from the roadway intersection, from the Duffy Way, Taunton Ave, Division Street intersection, water actually just makes its way into that little area um, behind their properties. So the, the proposed design will have a vertical granite curb all around the site and obviously in particular in that area. Uh, we've also, <clears throat> we also have, a, there's a small retaining wall actually right where Mike is highlighting it at the property line. And that is because, because we've raised, uh, you know, the elevation of the building is where it has to be uh, and to meet, you know, grading ADA requirements coming out from the front of the building, there is a bit of a grade change between, the, between Duffy Way, the realigned Duffy Way and the abutting properties. So there is a, um, a cast in place retaining wall with a screening fence uh, on top of it. Um, it's it's just a few feet within the within uh, the school property line, so there is no there will be no runoff from the school property um, getting onto that parcel. Uh, we'll have catch basins along that curb edge. Everything will be collected in those catch basins, um, so there should be no runoff. Any there should be no runoff. We should be reducing the amount of runoff uh, going to those properties. And uh, like you said, with these uh, bio detention areas, like area two, you have um, that elevated walkway going through. So you that's basically just going to be a, a foot high, foot or two high at the max. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. It's only I think two two feet. Uh, Mike, I'm not sure if we show. We're probably going to have to have you know some we have edge edge yeah. railings there. Dark. Yeah. So we'll be. Okay. There'll be handrails there. Um, but yeah, it, it's only going to be, you know, two, two and a half feet, I believe, at the most. I can check those elevations. But right. well, I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, I mean, if kids are walking that live or live close enough by, if they're walking down there and jumping off it or whatever, you know what I mean? I'm like, how high is it? Yep. Yeah. It, it'll be high enough that it'll require guardrails. We're going to widen it a little bit so it's not just the walkway. And in the, some of the widened parts where the guardrails are, we're going to incorporate that interpretive signage. Um, discussing the the, system, the bioretention systems in it and stuff like that. So we're going to sort of incorporate all that, that signage and education element into the into that walk. And that's a good spot for it because that's the main walkway for any students walking to the site. They'll have to cross that. They'll have to cross that boardwalk. The idea behind it was to pull the walkway away from the curb of the, of the driver. So as, as kids are walking to the school, uh, you know, they're walking in the east to west direction towards the school, but there's an op there could be a time when cars are leaving in the opposite direction. So we didn't want the kids right up against there. So by pulling it away, it a, creates a safer environment for the kids and it also creates a really nice experience. It's not too many areas where you see where you have to cross a boardwalk over a bioretention area to get to your new school. So we thought it was a really nice design element, too. Yeah, I was just, just wondering and making sure it wasn't that high where kids are going to be. Well, no, two feet, I think, you know, two feet, six you know, feet. Hanging off it or jumping over the handrails, you know, okay. I mean, it's a six foot drop, you know? Yeah. Well, the worst they're going to do is end up knee deep in mud, so. Well, <laughs> been there before. <laughs> Haven't we I, I have a question. Charlie? So, when do you think construction would start, and roughly, and 
are you going to be able to maintain the traffic flow to Memorial Park while this is under construction? And what's the kind of the plan for that? You may be covering that later on down the road, but it just kind of struck me as we're talking about this right now. Uh, yep. So <clears throat> we have we have established some preliminary uh, phasing plans for construction, um, and the intent is to keep Duffy Way open uh, with a, a essentially 24 foot wide drive aisle to maintain two way access to the existing Memorial Park School, which will be uh, operational kept operational throughout construction. Okay. Um, so those where you see the parking, the well, it doesn't show up on this plan, but the existing parking spaces along Duffy Way, um, kind of the, the, there'll be a fence just north of that so that th those spaces will likely be contractor parking. And then there's enough width um, to, uh, to provide a 24 foot wide drive aisle. Um, between that and the property line. Um, so we have, we have thought through some of that um, as, as well as just uh, pedestrian circulation um, as well as parent drop off and bus drop off during construction. Okay. So you would, it would basically be just a road with no parking for drop off. Correct. Yep. So, right. So those spaces that are on Duffy Way now would likely be utilized by, you know, by the contractor. Um, we've, um, some of the spaces along Reed Street, um, we, we on, on the, on the phasing plans that we've developed, we show um, that as being staff parking as well as we'll have a temporary, uh, we'll expand an area south of the existing school. Um, it's, it's an existing bituminous area that the that the town or the, the parks department uses for some material stockpiling. Uh, we'll be expanding that a little bit and converting that to temporary parking as well. Um, so we've got we've got that diagrammed out already. Will you be using the right of way um, out to Reed Street? No, nope. That will remain that will remain closed off. And we had considered that it's it's so tight when you if you're coming like let's say you're coming into the site from Reed Street the building is there you it's really tough to take any sort of left or right turn to get around there uh, so that'll remain really as a pedestrian path for you know again for drop off uh, the people that use Reed Street to drop off as well as for staff that are parking along Reed Street um, but we did not think that opening up that area for vehicular circulation um, was, was practical. Okay, thank you. Yep. Where, would, um, where would the employees that are doing the construction there, is there any site parking for them? Because all the parking on, you know, Duffy Way there is not gonna be enough for the people that are working on the school when it gets rolling. Yep. So, I mean, there's, there'll be, you know, a section of those spaces used and then we'll, we'll also have some, um, you know, some areas we we're showing some areas around the, mostly on the South side or the Southwest corner of the new building, there'll be some, uh, you know, gravel lay down areas and, uh, additional contractor parking spaces. I mean, it, it is a very tight area, you know, I mean, there's particularly during, you know, the first phase, uh, which is in the spring of next, scheduled to start in the spring of next year. Um, while school's in session, you know, they are gonna be fairly constrained with space. Of course, they're not gonna have, you know, within that few month period of time, they're not gonna have oh, all the foundation put in yet. So they, they'll have place to move around. And then over the summer, they'll be taking up a little more real estate in front of the school temporarily. So that'll offer some more, you know, space. Obviously, they'll have more space in the summer months. Um, because but, I, uh, I know when they were, I, I worked at the high school, middle school project, and I know that people were parking at the time at the tennis courts because they were being done over. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So just so you don't have all the construction workers parking, you know what I mean, up and down the 
people's neighborhoods, mm -hmm. which would just make it matters worse with the traffic and everybody going going to school. Right. Yeah, I mean, we, we can certainly, um, you know, as we define those those plans more, we can certainly share them with you. Um, we, we did not put them in the package. However, um, you know, there's still some things to be to be ironed out, but certainly we could share them if if the board would like that. Yeah, because that, that's something to consider because when it's, what do you project for full peak when it's, when it's grown, how many people on site, you know what I mean? You're looking at a hundred plus. Yeah, I think a building of this size, you'll be like 125, 150 at the peak. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, if you don't supply parking for them, they're just gonna be parking in everybody's neighborhood. It, the intent is that they're parking within the construction fence. And as Chris said, the fence moves for, we have five phases, I think, ten, different phases all together. Yep. Two of them encompass two summers, um, but it'll be, you know, there'll be no parking and there'll be no tolerance of parking on the high school or the middle school parking lots or, or um, I, I mean, a public street is a public street. So, but you can't restrict somebody from parking on that, but they'll be strongly encouraged to park within the, the site fence. Right, just cause I'm like, if everyone's parking on Lower Reed Street or anything, you know what I mean? It's just more of a traffic hazard with everybody going to, drop their kid off and pick their kid up. Yep. We'll be adding more signage for the lower Reed Street parking um, because some of that will be designated for teacher parking with the loss of some of the parking where the school is being built and some will remain drop off. So there'll be additional signage on the parking that exists today. Because yeah, you, know, you know when people start work early and they're beating the, beating the teachers there, all those parking spaces at, at the track are gonna be gone. Again, those are the ones that we are going to assign. So those are going to be those are going to be signed differently and used differently during construction. Uh, signs, are, signs are one thing, you know. I mean, teachers probably should get badges or something from the school. <laughs> True. Anybody else? Okay, anything, yep. Anything else on stormwater management or utilities? Okay, we're gonna hand it over to our traffic consultants, Brandon Consulting. They're gonna talk about a little bit about traffic and with a focus on the intersection redesign at Taunton and Division Street. Go hey, ahead, Chris. My name is Chris Emilius and I have Conrad Nuffman with me here. We're from Brennan Consulting and we performed a traffic impact study for the project and we are now working on the uh, intersection design of Duffy Way, Division Street, and Taunton Avenue. So we performed a traffic impact study some months ago. Um, we, we analyzed the three uh, primary intersections around the school, uh, the intersection of Duffy Way, Division, and Taunton, um, Division, and uh, Reed, and Reed, and the driveway coming up from Duffy Way. And we Perform traffic counts um, in the a.m. and p.m. peak hours, uh, obviously during school. Um, and we performed the analysis to look out a seven year future, um, which is part of the methodology performing a traffic impact study. Um, and then we added the additional students. We all know we have 340 students presently in the 55 uh, administrative personnel and we're going to 760 students and approximately 800 uh, personnel, uh, administrative personnel and uh, teachers. Uh, so we, we added the additional trips based on the additional students. We reanalyzed the three intersections um, for what we call operating characteristics, things like delay, uh, queue, um, volume over capacity analysis. Basically, you're looking at how much delay time is presently at the intersections for each approach and how much delay time will be there seven years post the construction of the school. Um, and what we found was, not just in the analysis, but of the numerous trips out um, at the school, 
uh, was that it's, it really runs actually quite well from a traffic perspective. Um, the delays were 10, 11, 12 seconds in that range for each of the intersections. And uh, when we did the analysis and we added the additional trips based on the additional students, um, a little bit of delay time was added, a couple seconds here and there, but for the most part, really all of the intersections stayed at a level of service A or B. And when we look at intersections, we literally grade them as you would a, 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 a paper in school. A is the best and F is failing. And you have variations from A to F, all dependent on the delay. So we found that there really was not a, uh, a big impact primarily because the intersections are, have excess capacity right now. Um, then we looked at um, Duffy Division and Twine Avenue, and as you, Chris described, the, um, the need to have uh, Duffy Way really move north, um, we found that the whole intersection, uh, Twine Avenue also need to move north. Um, and now, Presently, we have an intersection that you know we call uh, uh, three legs um, and three approaches. So each of those three roads is an approach and a leg. We are adding a fourth leg, which is the bus loop, to the intersection. So now it's a it's a four way intersection, but we only have three approaches. Uh, it's only a, it's a one way for the bus loop, so we don't have that approach coming into the intersection of the bus. So right now we're in the process of creating that design, um, both working with Chris on the drainage and also the, the uh, geometrics of the intersection itself. It does not warrant the signal, not even close, so if that uh, was always a, an initial concern. Um, and basically, we're, again, working on the, the geometry of the intersection itself, and, uh, as someone had mentioned earlier, we we're looking at how we would construct the intersection um, in phases so that we maintain uh, traffic throughout the reconstruction process of the intersection. Uh, and I think we also need to uh, talk to Chris. I don't know if you met or talked with the highway uh, superintendent about there's the possibility that this intersection could be done um, without any, uh, you know, just shutting it down and, and constructing it, I don't know, six, seven weeks, I think it could be done. But if that's not workable, then certainly we can do it in phases where we construct each part like a puzzle, basically. So that's, that's where we're at now. Um, and uh, I don't know, is there any questions? I don't hear any. Okay. Well, if anything else comes up, we can we can always circle back to this. Right. Right. And we're we're in the design phase of the uh, of the plans of, of you know the uh, intersection itself. Or again, as you can see from the existing to the proposed, you can see the whole intersection is shifted north, um, but still obviously within the right of way. Um, but, but there's, there is plenty of right of way out there to do this. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So we're gonna move on to building design now. And Mariana Hernandez from our office is going to walk everybody through the design of the structure itself. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so we saw some of the images of the building already in the in the side is pictures. So I'm gonna move uh, more into the materials one. Uh, I'm gonna show you the floor plan and how it works. We're gonna see some of the overall elevations, a couple of renderings that are, that you already saw. Uh, building material distribution, uh, it's just a graphic showing how the building materials are. And some of the samples of the building materials we're using. This is an old masonry building with large scale metal panels at primary elevation and some cordon wool. Brick is the predominant material in the building and it relates to the adjacent middle school, high school and the Union Street corridor. 
The, we have some variations in the brick texture and patterning just to bring a little bit of a variety to the exterior without any major additional cost. Can you go to the next one? So on the first floor plan, we have the administration area at the north. We have the gymnasium and the cafeteria. Uh, and we have a, a, the a service area down south from the cafeteria and then the classrooms uh, that are everything is organized around that center courtyard that Mike described earlier. The classrooms are organized in, in neighborhoods or pods per grade uh, to bring a sense of a closer community to the kids. And on the first floor, we have uh, clockwise from the north, we have first grade and then second grade to the south. Each class, each level has two pods. Between the pods, we have those exterior learning environments that Mike described. They can be accessed uh, from the inside uh, via the exterior, the stairs that are located in the pods, and they also can be accessed through the corridors in the middle of the, of the school. Uh, you can go back to the next slide. Sorry, to the next slide. On the second floor, which we can approach through those uh, centers stairs right across the street, right across from the entrance. Uh, we have the media center, a maker space, a music room and art rooms, and, and the third and fourth grade classrooms. Again, they are located uh, clockwise from the north. So that's the third grade classrooms. And then on the south, we have the fourth grade classroom. They're stacked on top of the you know, it's first stacks with third and fourth stacks with second. And again, they use the stairs to access directly those exterior learning environments. You can go to the next one. So here we have some, some overall elevations of the building where you can see the main material, it's brick. Uh, we have two colors of brick They are shown more drastic on these elevations that they actually are than this is for graphic purposes. So we have the main building material, the main brick, brick type one, which covers most of the building. And I'll show that better in a different graphic coming down. And then the brick type two, which is the, the one that is showing dark, darker and is showing some lines. Those are reveals that we have incorporated into the design every two feet. And uh, now you can you can move to the next one. Okay, here are some of the renderings. You you already saw some of these. So we have an aerial view on the top uh, left, and and the entrance approach uh, right underneath. And here we you can see the metal panel location is mostly there on the on the maker space volume that projects out and above the to the left, if you move to the left above the guidance area, we have some metal panel and the whole entrance is framed by this uh, phenolic panel uh, ceiling canopy. And we have the cordon walls that connect. Uh, actually, Mike, can you go back to the floor plans again one second? Sorry, okay, you can stay there. So on the floor plans, we have cordon wall on the north and on the south connecting through that courtyard. So we, we have a visual connection from the north of, of the side to the south of the side through the courtyard. It's all like Cornwall that connects those two main parts of the building. So go back to, sorry, my, go back to where we were. Okay, and then, so we hear uh, on the right side on the top, we see that learning environment uh, area that we already saw. We have some sun shading elements on the exterior, uh, on the south facades. And uh, we also have some bay windows that will bring a little bit of color on those. And then if you move down from, from that view, we have the view of the courtyard looking south. We can see there a le an exterior learning uh, uh, stair that we have there and that connects to an interior one too which is it will be really nice we're still working on, on that design mm -hmm. and then we have some they, there was a request for some pops of color in the building 
And we are trying to achieve that by bleeding out from some of the windows, from the interior treatment on the windows to the outside. Most of the fenestrations are punch windows. The corner walls are highlighting these main corridors and the intersections between the pots. Uh, you can keep going. Okay, so this one is a graphic a plan that shows the materiality of the, of the building. So the first uh, uh, building type one, it's, it's going mostly around the whole building. It's the main material as you saw in the other views too. Br brick type two happens on the volume for the gym and, and court, um, for the volume of the gym and, and cafeteria that is a higher volume and also inside the courtyard and on the points where the exterior learning environments meet the, the corridors of the building. Then we have a, the curtain wall that as I said, connects the north and south uh, of the building through the courtyard. And then we also have cordon walls on the points where, where the pots meet and on the, ex, on the stairs, on the stair volumes, and on the clear stories of the, of the uh, gym and, and cafeteria uh, space. And then we have CMU uh, finish on the service area of the loading dog and all the mechanical equipment area. You can go to the next slide. Okay, this shows the type of materials that I've been talking about. Uh, we have the, the main material being brick, then we have some CMU, we have the phenolic panel framing the entrance, we have metal panel mostly around the entrance and in some uh, as accent in some of the cordon wall conditions. And we have some cordon walls and window openings. Uh, our window to wall ratio right now is 24.3%, which is very good based on what we require. You can go to the next one. And this is my last slide. The next. Mike, can you move to the next slide? This is my last slide, and it's actually a close up of the materials that we are using. These are the samples that we have in the office for the materials. So there's the CMU, we, there's the two on the top. You have the, on the top brick, you have the color one, uh, which is the field brick, if you will. Then the color two, which is down below, it's, it's close in color, a little darker, but mostly it's more, it has more of a rough texture to it. And this is the one where we're gonna have the reveals every two feet vertically. Uh, the phenolic panel on the top right, which is a wood looking material, is a composite a rain screen uh, that looks like wood and that is framing the main entrance as, as a canopy. Then we have the, the color that we chose for the metal panel. This color will be all the metal elements on the building, the, the metal trims, the metal panels, the window frames and cordon wall frames, and as well as the sun shade. And then we have, and I forgot to mention before, um, uh, that's the precast uh, trim material that will have as, uh, the precast seals on the windows. And there's also a couple elements that will have some precast on the, on the facade, um, like the bench in the front that we did not mention before. So that is all for me, if you have any questions. Anybody? Thank you. Okay, we're available for questions, I suppose. Does anybody have any questions? Randy? Nope. Um, no, I'm good. Charlie? Is Charlie still here? Yep, no, I'm still here. Um, no, I don't have any questions. It looks good. 
Um, it's going to be a big endeavor, but we'll see how it goes. Jared? No, I'm good. One of the um, benefits of being on the building committee is being intimately involved with this uh, project uh, on the side of planning. So I'm good. Thank you. John? No, I think for right now, I'm good. Yeah, I think I'm good for right now, too. I know you have to go before zoning, you know, to get some stuff. Uh, Rob Rose is still with us. Rob, do you have any questions at this time? The only thing that I saw was the there's an under drain that looks like it's dumping into the, the baseball field that's going to stay. And I'm just wondering how much water that, that under drain is going to kind of pick up and dump into the dump into the uh, baseball field because it all drains down and then goes towards the senior center and then that back corner. Mike Dohan, I believe that's the under drain for the synthetic turf field. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, I'm, I'm going back. Go ahead, Chris. I'm, I'm going to try to go back to the plan. Sorry, Just hit uh, escape, Mike, and you can go back. Yeah. Rob, sorry, is that the under drains for the field itself, Rob? No, I was. Uh, it was bordering. It looked like parking area. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So there's. We have a. <clears throat> we have like a curtain drain, under drain. Yep. Curtain right drain. Right along. Yeah, it's right along, like uh, right along the large, the northwest parking lot between the abutting property and the, the, the parking lot. Um, yep. So that that is basically. Um, because we had to raise the raise the parking lot up, up a little bit based mm -hmm. on the building elevation under existing additions the runoff from those essentially it's just the lawns and you know uh, driveways from the abutting properties it normally it under existing additions it basically made its way into a little kind of a natural landscape gutter and worked its way around towards the, the baseball field. So because of the elevation of the parking lot, we put that under drain in there and we piped it out. Um, there's a, right, there's a little head wall right there. Um, I can, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head as to how much flow is getting, um, but it is a mixture of, you know, it doesn't get any of the Reed Street roadway. It's just the, it's just the, um, residential properties just to the north over there right. and um, that's and is though is what you're showing on the on the computer right now is that the most up to date because what i saw was a flared end section that went even further on the last plan on the last set of plans that i was given yeah i believe yes the <clears throat> the the flared end is goes further down on the side of the parking lot um and that was only because of the grade in order to get the pipe positive drainage out of there we had to bring that head wall a little bit lower um you know i mean we can we can certainly look at how to just make sure that that gets dispersed so it's not just a you know uh you know a stream of water over there yeah if you just, if you look at the contours it's just it's all going towards the yeah the so that's it that was really the only thing that i saw Uh, Pat, Brennan, do you have any comments or anything? Have, all, have you been satisfied with everything so far? Um, yeah, I just got revised stormwater plans and stormwater report uh, late last Thursday. So I just really got into that today. Um, to my understanding, this is design review with the planning board. Um, typically, my comments are related to site plan review. Um, with the drainage and the stormwater and that type of thing. Uh, the package that I got was actually the package from the zoning board, um, which um, they, they provided all of the information that I would typically need for a site plan review. Um, Chris Racine from um, SMMA has been in contact with me for over the last couple of months, kind of discussing uh, various aspects of the design uh, like I said, I just got into it, but um, going through the entire drainage today, uh, you know, I have some minor comments that I'll, I'll 
review with Chris, but I don't see anything major there that can't be overcome. Um, the, the only other question, and I, I guess it would be for the zoning board, because this is the design review right now, um, is the traffic if, if you're gonna want it peer reviewed. Um, if so, I'd, ha I'd send it out to Gillen Associates for peer review. Um, I, I have not done that because I have not been asked to do that. What do you think, Rob? Uh, at this point, I'm going to take it under advisement. Uh, I gotta, I'm going to have to discuss this with, with everybody else. Um, I think it should be addressed. And it, it's, I, I do think a, tra a, a traffic engineer involved in this to review. I, I think that's, I, I think it should be addressed. Um, yeah, so when we reviewed, because I was involved with the review of the middle school, high school project back in 2010, roughly that, that time frame, um, it did go through site plan review as well as design review with the planning board. Um, I did um, ask attorney Galvin about this one for site plan review and his email, email response was that he thought it was needed, but he, he was going to check into it. And I, I, I didn't follow up with him, so I'm not sure um, why there isn't site plan review along with it. Not to throw a wrench into it, but um, the, the other schools went through that process. If, if I may just let you know, it was actually Attorney Galvin who told us the site plan review was not required for this project when we met with the town manager. And, and John, I believe you were at that meeting with Doug. I, when... I was there, Lorraine, and I'm questioning whether Bob was thinking of something else because the high school and the middle school, we did do a site plan review. And I talked to the chairman of the planning board at that time, and he said definitely was required. And to be honest, I forgot about it till almost today, but I think we should take a look at it. I think probably we have to do a site plan review. My, my review, yeah, my review is gonna cover, I'm looking at it as if I'm reviewing it for site plan review. Um, I was also contacted by a conservation's peer reviewer and they're gonna rely on my stormwater review for, the, for conservation as well. So I'm looking at it for all three boards at this point, the planning, zoning, and, um, and conservation. So, you know, from my perspective, I'm reviewing it as if it was going through site plan review, um, just so that we capture it all. And we don't have to do something, redo something again down the road. In my, in my opinion, I think there should be a site review on it just because it's town building, it better be able to pass. If we've set the standards for everybody else in town <laughs> to make sure they conform, the town building better conform. Well said, lead by example. You know, I don't know why the town would get a free pass. You know what I mean? It doesn't make any sense. But I think there should be, you know, a, a traffic study done just because there, there's going to be so much traffic going through there at certain times between all three schools in the same area. And you're increasing the traffic flow with combining the two other schools there. Pat, did you say they did a site, a traffic review, uh, peer review? Um, for the other two schools? Uh, yes, yes, we did. If we did it for those two, I think we should probably do it for this. Not that I doubt what your traffic people are saying, but I think a, another check on it is probably the right way to go. And with the new situation with, with COVID-19 here and everything like that, how many people are gonna wanna put their kids on a, on a bus? I'd actually have more drive up traffic at this point. So can I just ask a, a two process questions, the peer review of the traffic that gets handled directly through you guys, or do we need to do anything for that? Who is initiating that? Pat, you can initiate that, can't you? As long as one of the two boards tells me to. Uh, I'll make a motion if someone would like to second that for the board. I'll second it. All right, let's have a vote on that motion. Uh, Randy? Yes. Jared? Jared's still there. Charlie? 
Yes, I uh, agree with that and vote in favor. Sorry, right. I did a video and I, I didn't realize I was on mute still. Jared is yes. Okay. Thank you. And John? Yes. All right. And I'm Mike Corbett and I vote yes. I think we have a traffic review on that just with the new situation with COVID-19 and everything to people might not want to take the bus. And then just my second process question, since Bob had originally, um, I just looked at the date, it was back in January when we met and went through all the permits required. Can we just ask for a clarification uh, from him on the site plan review process, please? Tony, are you still on? Uh, yes, I am. Um, but I'm not sure, I wasn't at that meeting in January and I'm not sure what Bob uh, told everyone, but I can check with him tomorrow to forward that list along. I just don't know it right now. Bob was on a telephone call on that particular meeting. Um, and like I said, when I talked to, um, I can't think of his name, Henderson. Uh, oh, Tom Henderson? Tom Henderson, who was chairman of the planning board at the la uh, middle school and high school. Um, he said it definitely went through a site plan review. I think it should, but yes, we can double check with him. Yeah, thank I, you. I, I, he might have said, I just don't know. I just don't, I, I'm, I'm not saying yes or no. I just, I just don't know what he said. Just for your reference, the date of that meeting was January 31st of this year. Okay, I'll, I'll check on that tomorrow. Thank you. Me. And Tony, when you get an answer on that, can you uh, have him yourself? Uh, uh, Bob, send out an email to the planning board so we have that on record. Will do. Yeah, I mean, cause I, like I said, I think it should uh, be held to the town standards if it's a town building, if we make everybody else in town conform to the town standard. Yeah, I'll check, I'll check with them first thing tomorrow morning and send an email. Thank, Thank you, Tony. You. Thank you, Tony. So I think for us, we just, um, we're anticipating being back on in front of you on June 11th. We have our ZBA hearing on June 2nd. Um, yes. The only potential problem I see with that is if we don't have the uh, um, report from the ZBA by that time, hopefully they'll have it written up for us so that we don't, nothing gets stalled out and delayed. Because I'm sure you got, I know there's several variants that you got for in there. It's just one variance we're going for. And that's what, parking? Parking size. Okay. The ratio, or the, the exact uh, variance is ratio of uh, parking si space size. We're asking for 100% parking spaces, 9 by 18, instead of 30%, which is outlined in the zoning regulations. Correct. Same exact thing that was asked for at the middle school, high school. Yep. Rob, do you think that'll be any problem getting that decision back to us? I'll push it. Thank you. Yep. Does anybody else have anything? With Rob still on the line, any, any delay that becomes incurred costs tax dollars at the end of the day. This is a town project, so. Uh, anything that can be done for the uh, timely issuance of, of zoning board um, zoning board uh, decisions be appreciated. Don't worry, Jared. I'm on it. All right. Have, have it. Have it. You. And, and, and write it up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it's the you, you've got a chairman now that knows how to use Wing, uh, Microsoft Word, so it's <laughs> usually it's 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 been easier now. Either that or a pencil, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I think that's our presentation uh, for you tonight. Unless you have any more questions for us. Does anybody else have any questions? I'm on that, Mike. What is that, John? I'm all set. Jared? I'm good. 
Thank you. Charlie? Yeah, I'm all set. Thank you. Randy? All set. Thank you. All right, I guess we're all set with you people for, for, for tonight. <laughs> yeah, Thank Mike, you very I just, much. I just Go ahead, sorry. Question. Sorry. So is there any, um, aside from the topics we discussed, is there any specific information that you would like us to provide that for next for the next meeting that we did not have for this or or in the actual application uh, I don't, I don't th I, the plan seemed to be pretty complete you have existing conditions and everything else like that on there um, does the building have show any of the setbacks or anything like that on it from the uh, plot lines we, and everything I don't have it in this. I have a. I do have a, a setback plan that we had submitted to the zoning to the ZBA that that I could you know that we could share or provide you with. Yeah, if you can do that, that way we, you know, know how how it's situated on the from the property lines and stuff like that. To just make you make sure yep. we make all the setbacks, which I, I don't think is going to be a problem. But yep, at least no, we we do hour. right. We we're fine with all the building setbacks. Um, and when, as well as the parking setbacks. Yeah, so at least, you know, I mean, if you can send us a copy of that. Sure. That way everyone can access it and make sure, so we have it for our records. So we, you know, get this thing proceeding forward. And when you have finalized plans, you know, we need a copy of that too, because are you making more changes do you anticipate to what you printed up so far? Um, and you know, on, on the building or the site or, or and on anything, you know, I mean, are you, are you going to be changing any of the page, pages per se, or like if you have to redo the intersection over or changes for whatever reason, that's taught in Colonel Duffy and division, or is that pretty much set in stone? So we're not anticipating any major changes, but we are only in, um, contract documents, early contract document stage. So we do have um, quite a bit of work to document and provide all the finished details, et cetera. But, you know, with that's really developing the, you know, the details needed to construct the project. We're not anticipating any major changes um, to the scope that's been submitted to you. Okay. But if you can get us that, uh, a set of plans with, with all the setbacks and everything like that, just yep. the way we have it for our record and we can look at it for the next time we meet. We'll send that out. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, before we go, Pat, can you stay before we everybody leaves? Yes, I can stay. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions for the school project? All right. All right. I, I just Thanks. also I want to I want to say thank you to Christine for helping out getting this all set up. She's been very helpful uh, throughout the whole process. So thank you, Christine. Thank you. And she's ours, you can't have her. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks guys. All right, thank you. Right. Bye -bye. Thank you, good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. All right. That's all right for uh, potential plans and upcoming activities. Um, Mr. Corbett, I'm going to leave. I appreciate you letting me speak. All right. All right. Thank you, Rob. We'll talk to you. See y'all. Bye, Rob. Bye, Rob. Uh, thank you. See y'all. Have, Pat, have you heard anything back about uh, 365 Conscious Street? Um, just just what you saw from Attorney Galvin. Um, I, I did not forward that to the applicant but i can do that ba basically just just for the board's information they submitted a preliminary uh, plan unit development plan for 365 concord street um i started looking at it and based on what i looked at it looked like they needed a, a number of, and actually it's it states the variances that they need right on the cover sheet um so they either need to go to zba first to to secure those variances or it's got to be submitted as a 40b um and in all honesty i think i don't think that that um meet all the criteria to secure those variances so it's probably gonna end up being a 40b project 
Okay. Yeah. We, Chris, have we heard from them? Did we reach out to them? I talked to Kayla. Yeah. She was going to reach out to you, Pat, I believe, and to Rob. Um, so she could get things going with the ZBA. Okay. And that was last week. Yeah, I, I haven't heard from her yet, um, but I'm sure I will then. <laughs> Not too lucky. <laughs> I'm, you're being recorded. <laughs> I'm just saying he's lucky to talk to Kayla. Nice. <laughs> All right. Uh, so that if that goes to a 40B, then we're out of it totally. Yeah. That would yeah. be correct. Hey, that one, do we have anything else planned then? Any, I, think, oh, I think I was it, Pat. You know I mean? I was just wondering if yeah. we for Bob yet, because I know I haven't heard anything, but I mean, status quo. Thank you, Pat. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good night, man. Chrissy, thank you. Thank you. All right. Does anybody else have any new activities since the last time we did this? No. Nope. We need to go back to the meeting normally. Yeah, I, I hear you on that. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So hopefully. Hopefully we'll hail back from uh, Attorney Galvin on if we need a site plan because it's kind of crazy that we don't. But like I said, I don't know why we, the town building wouldn't have to be approved and we hold everybody else to the same standard. Well, unless something's changed, Mike, since they did the, the high school, the middle school, I think that uh, I, I don't think Attorney Galvin was uh, thinking on it because if it went to it for the other two schools, I'm sure it's got to go to it for us. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, I don't foresee why we wouldn't. Um, just strange that he would he would say that. This way we're just so consistent. All right, so I guess that's about it. Chrissy will have to reach out to two buds for uh the design review and when they get sent over the new plans with the modification. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just reach out to them so we can finalize that for, for them. Okay. We can maybe schedule them for the end of June since uh, 365 Concord Street might not be before us and we already had the meeting scheduled. You know what I mean? I don't really want them to be scheduled for the 11th when we do the school. Okay. You know I mean? All right, sounds good. Does anybody else have anything? Can I, are we gonna be getting new plans from the school? Or should I keep this monstrosity that's occupying a lot of space in my home? Well, didn't she more or less indicate that they weren't gonna make any major changes, so? Yeah, I would, I would think you would have to hang on to them. All right, I'll hang on to it. You know what I mean, because she said there are going to be no major changes that they foresee, and they're just going to send us at least an hour. Uh, possible for us to make any major changes anyway. And, you know, send us an email copy of uh, the setbacks and everything in the building. So we can at least have a site plan. Everything else is kind of on the what we have with the existing conditions and everything. Mm hmm. And then after you're done, you can make very large paper airplanes with it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If nobody has anything else, do I hear a motion? Oh, actually, I move that we close. Huh? I move that we close the meeting. I will second. Jared Allen's all a second. Chrissy, you no bills today? No, nothing. Not even for you? No, I didn't. I'm going to wait. Okay. That works for me. All right. We have a motion and seconded. Uh, Randy? Randy, yes. Charlie? Yes. Good night. Jared? 
Garrett, yes. Ron? John, yes. All right. Michael, yes. All right. Thank you, gentlemen and Chrissy. All right. Have a good night. All right. Everyone have a good night. Good night, everyone. All right. Thank you, Lisa.